How many times have you lost your keys? Hopefully around the same number of times you found them. Of course, there are many things we lose and can never find again, or we find things that we were never looking for in the first place. Our deepest losses are of loved ones, as are our most precious finds. Our relationship to the ideas of what is lost and found tends to be somewhat transactional. We think of each mostly in their aftermath, perhaps hoping to forget loss as quickly as possible and seldom appreciating what we find long enough. The ideas of lost and found are often seen as opposites and mutually exclusive. One of the most popular hymns of all time, Amazing Grace, has in its chorus the famous line, I once was lost, but now I'm found, as if their relationship is always neat and sequential, when more often than not, they are messy and intertwined. Our daily lives are filled with lost and founds, ranging from the trivial, the aforementioned keys, to the life-altering, love. Not all of what is lost and found is tangible. We lose faith, find joy. We lose confidence, we find meaning. Recently, I was sitting looking out at the Hudson River, which is actually an estuary, meaning the water at times will flow both north and south at the same time, lost and found, flowing at once. A woman with her young child, who looked to be around two or three, came up and sat beside me. As she tried to frame what she hoped to be the perfect picture of him with the reflecting water in the background, he bent over and picked something up. With the light, she asked him, Honey, what have you found? But looking closer, she realized what he was holding and yelled, George, that's goose poop. Drop it. He loses the poop. I have found a funny story. Recently, I found the book Lost and Found by Katherine Schultz while browsing in a local bookstore. She contemplates these ideas through the loss of her father and the finding of her partner, all happening around the same time in her life. Their connection is unmistakable. The and in the title is the operative word. I hope that I will see what I have lost and found in life with the same profundity with which Schultz writes. Rather than run from loss, she embraces it. She notes on the book's final pages a photo that has been beside her during much of its writing. It is from her wedding day. In the photo is her partner and her mother. There's a hole where her father should be. His loss is an affirmation of life, a reminder to enjoy the moments while we have them. May you appreciate what you lose and find with equal clarity. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today, I'm talking with Katherine Schultz. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning staff writer at The New Yorker and author of Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error. Her latest book, Lost and Found, is a wonderful and beautiful read. Our conversation touched on many topics like life, death, love, and loss, helping me see each in a new light. I hope you enjoy. So thank you again for joining. I want to apologize in advance for what is going to be probably the most gratuitously long wind up to a first question you've probably heard in a while, (laughs) which is actually how I came to find your book. I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you just went to a bookstore looking for something, but nothing in particular, and then felt completely underwhelmed by the options in front of you. Uh, And I was, one day I was in the bookstore and I was sort of looking around, everything just seemed so negative, you know, so many political books, so many books about what's wrong with the country. And I saw the title to your book, which stopped me in my tracks because I had actually several months ago suggested to my publishers at Penguin a children's book called Lost and Found. And it was about trying to make sense and meaning out of the pandemic. And, you know, the things that obviously so many children have lost so many things, but there also was an opportunity to find um, some new things in their lives through the creativity of themselves, their parents, their teachers, etc., And so I picked up the book and I looked at it and there was something about the duality of these two terms that also struck me. And again, uh, without (laughs) sort of too much information, I had just watched the movie Coda (laughs) and for the first time really listened to the lyrics from both sides now and sort of just these different perspectives. And so it just felt really fortuitous when I, when I picked up your book, which made me think as I was talking, coming to talk to you today, which was this idea of how we actually find things, what leads up to the finding, the looking, is it something that is about effort or serendipity? 
Um, is it individual agency or luck? And, and I was wondering how you've reflected on finding things in your own life and how maybe we as a society think about this idea of, of discovery. Well, the truth is, I think we probably don't think about it as much or as deeply as we might, except when confronted with uh, some kind of, you know, headline making discovery, you know, someone finds a, a new kind of dinosaur species or, or this kind of thing. Because um, <laughs> I do feel like finding uh, is is really woven into the fabric of life, almost even everyday life, uh, and yet not necessarily remarked upon unless it is spectacular in that way. And for me, part of what was interesting, I guess there were two things that were really fascinating about finding probably three. It'll probably be 10 by the time I'm done talking to you. <laughs> um, one of them is, is exactly what you just asked me about, which is obviously there are these two wildly different ways to find something. And one of them is is very effortful. It's to go out searching for it, uh, in which case you you know what you're looking for, at least broadly speaking, sometimes really specifically. You know, you lost your wallet, you, you retrace your steps, you're trying to find it. Uh, and, and sometimes in a much more general way. You're single, you'd like to be in a relationship, you're looking for true love. You don't really know with any degree of specificity who that person will be, but you know what it is you want. On the other hand, sometimes we find things completely by serendipity. You know, I, I tell the story in the book, one of the greatest finding stories I've ever heard of a, a, a little boy who is uh, literally almost hit by a falling star, by a meteorite, uh, and then he has to go out the next day and, and recover it from the field where it fell just a few yards from him. Uh, and I like that story because to me, it's such a perfect metaphor for that kind of finding. Like sometimes the cosmos really does just like drop something in our lap, you know? Uh, so, so those are really different experiences, obviously. But part of what's interesting to me is almost no matter how you find something, the experience itself is is generally a really delightful one. You know, we take a, an enormous amount of pleasure out of finding. Uh, and that's true whether we find something comparatively trivial or, or, or something completely life-altering, you know, like a soulmate or, or a career or meaning or faith or God, whatever it may be. I'm curious if you've had much reaction or if you thought about it yourself in, in, in writing this, the way in which we choose to tell our stories of finding something, whether mm. we acknowledge that serendipity, literally a, a star falling from the sky, or whether we overassume agency and, and effort, or whether you even see that maybe different people reflect different ways in terms of how they share how they've found something. Mm, I do think it's really variable and partly, of course, by, you know, the storyteller, but but also by the story. You know, I think one of the things I find really interesting about finding is that it's almost impossible to tell a story of discovery without finding yourself telling one of two kinds of stories. And one of them is, you know, sort of a hero went on a journey, right? You yourself go out there <laughs> and, and boldly search, uh, and, you know, exhaustively and, and probably, you know, overcome a lot of obstacles and take a lot of time and maybe money and you finally find what it is you're looking for. Those are the kinds of stories we often tell about, uh, you know, geographic discoveries or scientific discoveries. Um, and certainly plenty of discoveries in our own lives follow that that same kind of narrative trajectory. But then there are these other kinds of stories which uh, really do feel serendipitous. And in those, I think we generally make recourse uh, not to ourselves and our own, you know, will and intellect and, and patience and determination and these kinds of things, but actually far beyond ourselves to the forces of the cosmos. And how people tell those stories of serendipitous finding, I think, really depends on their on their cosmology, right? On their fundamental beliefs about the world. If you mm. are devout and believe in divine authority, uh, you will probably subscribe that kind of find to God. You know, you will you will call it a blessing or ordained or meant to be. And if you do not share that view, interestingly, you'll probably make recourse to the cosmos anyway. You know, it will feel it will feel like wild good luck or fate or fortune or, or one of these sort of less specific forces we invoke when we feel that the world has really astonished us in a good way. You know, there's so many things during the course of not just reading your book, but learning more about your work in general, where there was a very sort of serendipitous connection to just things I was either doing or thinking about. And so most recently, I think you wrote a piece in The New Yorker about um, shipping containers and shipping issues, right? <laughs> That's true. So, so you had you had you'd already agreed to come on the podcast. And I was like, I can't possibly believe that she wrote about that. Because when my first children's book was coming out, which is Three Little Engines, the modern retelling of the little engine, the could story, publication date was delayed because it was lost at sea on a shipping container. 
And, <laughs> and you reflect on these, uh, on this notion of like imagining where these lost things are, you know, sometimes obviously sort of polluting our oceans and stuff like that. And I reflect on these thousands of copies of a children's book being, you know, read by fish or discovered <laughs> on an island somewhere. But, but, but the, um, the, the notion of that sort of made me think about my own experience of, of loss, you know, certainly not on the par of a parent, which we'll talk about later, but this notion of how quickly when loss happens, we have to try to make sense of it, or we try to find some meaning in it, or we'll potentially be paralyzed. And it feels as if there's a more sort of acute and urgent need to tell a story about our loss than maybe in terms of something we found. And I don't know if that you find that sort of true, and, or, or what's, the, what's the primal urge to try to do that? Well, first of all, I just have to say that I'm both very sorry and also completely fascinated by the fact that you too have a book that was uh, lost overboard <laughs> in a shipping container. I, I will take one moment to tell you that actually the whole reason I wrote that article is that I, like many other people, I was very amused by a story in the New York Times, uh, I suppose amused at someone else's expense, but amused by a story in the New York Times about two cookbook authors whose books were in shipping containers that were thought to be lost at sea. And so their publication date was delayed as well. And I happened to mention this to a friend in the publishing industry. And she said, you'd be shocked how often it happens. <laughs> so you're both corroborating uh, her, her experience and also, uh, yes, informing readers of, of why I wrote that. I thought, wow, really? How often do shipping containers go overboard? Um, often, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you've gotten many strange calls in your, in, in your life, but when you get a call from your editor and they're like, we've got some bad news and that's, that's the news. <laughs> it's really like, is that even a thing? Yeah. That's about as weird as it comes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Not yeah. one of those things you even think to be worried about before your book comes out. Right. <laughs> uh, but to answer your question, I don't know that we tell our stories of loss with more urgency than we tell our stories of discovery. Um, I think, as with so many things about losing and finding, it really depends on on what it is we've lost or found. You know, people uh, certainly bring a lot of energy and enthusiasm to the project of telling the story of how they found their partner, right? I mean, you go out to to brunch with with friends of yours who just got together and, and you say to them, oh, how did you two meet? And those are some of the most delightful stories we tell, right? The stories of, of finding love and people people relish telling them and, and generally relish listening to them. So I don't think it's that our, our stories of loss are told more passionately, as it were. But I certainly think you're right that they call on us to to bring a lot more sense making to the experience especially when you've lost something really significant you know if if you've lost something some you know relatively replaceable material object uh, if it was comic you might well spin it as a as a funny yarn as i think many of us have done when we've uh, lost something in some ridiculous fashion or better still lost it and then then been reunited with it in some way or another but if you've lost something really significant a relationship to to a breakup or divorce or a loved one to death or to a cognitive uh, decline which is a terrible form of losing then yes i think that you know as as with almost every aspect of life we desperately want to put our experience into language and into an intellectual and emotional framework that will help us make some peace with it. And in that sense, I do think that uh, stories of loss have a special kind of status in that they are often meant to be cathartic or meant to promote a, an ultimate worldview or meant to provide the teller and in some cases the listener with a kind of peace. Have you, um, in preparing this book, thought about anything that was uniquely American about how we as a society approach loss and, and, and discovery or finding something. And, and what I mean by that is it seems as if this idea of never completely being satisfied, of always sort of yearning for more or better, of trying to find you know a new job, find a new partner, find something that is better than what we currently have, sort of a, a lack of contentment, or that we have a very unhealthy maybe relationship with loss, aversion, don't want to admit our own mortality or things like that that may be different from other societies and, and may shape the way we sort of walk around in our own lives and, and think about our, our journey. Well, I certainly think those are both very astute observations. Uh, and there's no question that especially when thinking about loss, 
I thought about our particular national cultural culture in two different respects, one at the comic end of the losing spectrum and one at the very serious end of the losing spectrum. Um, at the comic end, you know, I just think we're, we're no longer unique in this respect, but we certainly led the pack. We are an incredibly material culture. You know, Americans own vast numbers of things, uh, including a, a great many things that by any metric we don't really need and probably don't provide us with the satisfaction we hoped that they would. And of course, you know, the more things you have the more things you can lose <laughs> and i do think that <laughs> that that does help make the kind of everyday experience of losing things a really common part of american life you know if you have six different remotes and a work cell phone and a home cell phone and your house keys and your car keys and the keys to your other house and your other car well guess what <laughs> you have a lot more items that can go missing <laughs> um but I also, and, and more gravely, I do think, and I write about this some in the book, we are very bad at accepting the ultimate loss that is death. Um, we're bad at it as individuals in ways for which I'm very sympathetic because, of course, it's terribly hard to let go of someone you love. And we're bad at it as a culture in ways that are quite institutional and that are profoundly shaped by the American medical system, among other forces. And I do think that we would all benefit from a culture that was more accepting of the inevitability of death and that did more to shift our focus at the end of life from desperate measures to compassionate care, both of the dying and of the grieving and soon to be grieving. And I really experienced that firsthand. You know, my father, by the time he, he was truly dying, I think that any, if, if, if there were such a thing as a, you know, medical professional from Mars, uh, I, I think had they walked into that room, uh, it would have been quite obvious to them that my dad was dying. You know, I mean, almost every system of his was in, in failure uh, of, of one form or another. And yet the actual medical team uh, was so focused on problem solving and addressing mm -hmm. one crisis after another crisis after another crisis that that no one stepped back even when my family frankly kind of begged them to no one stepped back and said the truth is your your father your husband your loved one is dying and the best we can do for him is is help make that as comfortable as possible now the minute we ourselves made that decision and, and asked for hospice care, those folks were wonderful, you know. And I think the embodiment of of what we yeah. what we should have more of uh, in our lives, in our hospital systems, uh, in the culture in general. And they were so tender with us and with my dad, and and so clear sighted and plain spoken about death. And it was such a gift to all of us. And I understand why it's very hard for doctors. Uh, in in essence, it's asking them to wear almost two opposite hats you know their their job is to save lives and it's quite difficult to also task them with helping people recognize uh, the end of life when it is upon us and and doing so gracefully and peacefully and yet i do wish there were a lot more emphasis on that yeah it's it's interesting though um i wonder if i guess maybe a doctor does see that their 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 ultimate goal is to save lives but i wonder if it was a slight reframing of just improving life that a sort of a wider sort of perspective would be able to see that sometimes that is that's through allowing allowing death and loss yeah and there's no question that some doctors are are gifted at that yeah. you know and I, I don't mean yeah. in any way to kind of um, condemn the profession across the board I uh, in fact it was courtesy of, of some doctors who were uh, not on his medical team but just friends of my father's that, that we were able to make the decision that this really was the end mm. so so there are there are you know countless compassionate and clear-eyed doctors out there but I don't know that the system overall helps right. them remember that, that that is the real goal right is, is quality of life not just length of life yeah. On the other hand, as you pointed out, hospice workers are, I mean, you, you hear terms like they're just angels. And I mean, there really is just a, a wonderful gift and perspective they bring to that process. I wanted to, you know, we were just talking about your dad and I wanted to one, thank you for sharing your loss with, with readers, right? It's, it's, it's something I imagine is, is difficult, but hopefully also beneficial in terms of processing the way you feel. And I remember when I, again, was picking up your book in the beginning, I had conflicted feelings. Uh, on one hand, I was like, I want, I want to read this because I'm a father of three girls, right? And they're 14, 12, and 10, and hopefully I've got plenty of years left to enjoy their life and, and them and, and to whatever extent they want to enjoy my, me as well. <laughs> but I was also just really interested to hear and to read about a daughter's reflection on her father. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my perspective probably means very little, but I would just sort of add that if my daughter ever wrote about me the way you wrote about your father, 
I could imagine that would just be uh, just the most amazing gift and an affirmation of everything that he had done, you know, leading up to you putting those words on on, on paper. Hmm. Well, thank you for saying that. I do think that my father's primary reaction to this book and to the essay that that, that uh, it grew out of, uh, which was published in The New Yorker not long after his death, I, I think my dad, <laughs> I shouldn't say primary, but I think one of his, one of his many reactions would be, uh, seriously, you had to wait until I was dead to put me in the New Yorker and to write this book about me. Like now, when I can't read it, you know. Um, but I do. I, I take. I take comfort from from people like you saying that to me. You know that that a book like this would make any parent proud, and I take even more immense comfort from the knowledge that although my father didn't get to read this book or the original essay, I know. He knew, uh, not only at the end of his life, but every day of his life, how much his wife and daughters just adored him, uh, mm. and 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 beyond that too, you know, his friends in the community at large. But it is it is a great solace to me, which I say mainly uh, on behalf of your listeners um, to remind them of the most hackneyed truth you can possibly share, which is go tell the people you love how much you love them. I mean, it's really it's mm. it's such a solace and a peace to know that. Um, as much as I miss my dad, I did not miss the chance to make sure he knew exactly how I felt about him. Not in the 280-page version of the book, but in all the versions that mattered. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from the WNET Group reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org slash chasing the dream. Now back to the show. I was wondering, you talk a little bit about this in the book, but I was wondering if you could expand upon it. Like who you are is obviously a product of a lot of different sort of factors, you know, um, you know, chief among them, perhaps your, your parents and perhaps um, the influence of your father. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, about what he gave you. You talk a little bit about who he was and how he came to be and obviously your loss, but I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on just the, the ways in which being in a home and around him has shaped who you are today. Mm, yeah, it would be my absolute honor and pleasure uh, because I do think I owe much of my existence, my identity, my day-to-day -day life to my parents and certainly to my dad in countless ways. Uh, one thing my dad unmistakably gave me was my career. <laughs> I don't know that he meant to, but uh, but what I really mean by that is he gave me an incredible love of language and ideas. My dad spoke six languages. English was the last one he learned. He came to this country as a Jewish refugee uh, as a 12-year-old. And uh, nonetheless, he was, he was, you know, I fancy myself moderately good with words. I'm supposed to do things with them for a living. But, but my dad was, you know, three times as articulate and eloquent as I could ever hope to be and had six times the vocabulary. And he just relished it. He relished talking and conversation and the sound of sentences and poetry and literature and all the, all the really fun things you can do with words. And uh, there's no question that the sort of exuberant way he shared that love with his daughters uh, made me the writer that I am today. He also, uh, I, I think probably the most important thing my father gave me was a, um, a glimpse of his moral compass. And my dad really did have a, an unerring moral compass. He believed fiercely in justice, in compassion, in generosity, and modeled it all the time. And over and over again, helped show my sister and me the high road. And... It's shocking how often in life, and I guess a little dismaying, uh, how often um, I I am called upon to think about what my father would do and, and how he would take that high road. It's so easy to get drawn into truly petty scuffles and disagreements. And, and the thing my dad was really clear-sighted about was you're never going to come out of those looking better. <laughs> you're never going to come out of them feeling better. You know, if you have a kind of brief moment of glee, it's not going to be worth the cost internally, reputationally, in, in any way, shape, or form. So I, I really admired just kind of my father's way of being in the world as, a, as an ethical person. And I try very hard to emulate it. And I guess I'll say two more things. First of all, my father had a tremendous sense of humor. Uh, his name was Isaac, which means laughter in Hebrew. And he mm. was just a kind of comic genius, not because he was slapstick or, or told a bunch of jokes, but because he had a true wit. And I think that was because he he genuinely saw the humor in almost everything. And that was never at the expense of understanding 
the gravity of the world. I mean, my father lost most of his family in the Holocaust. He grew up very poor and surrounded by violence, familial violence, geopolitical violence. You know, my father had no illusions about about the existence of suffering in the world. And yet again and again, he, he chose the side of joy and he chose the side of, of compassion and of humor. So I'm, I'm grateful to him for that. And then lastly, and very centrally, my father just adored and really the two of them taught my sister and me by example every day what a loving relationship looks like. You know what it looks like to love your partner, what it looks like to love your children, even when they're throwing a temper tantrum or being difficult or growing up and making choices you yourself would not have made or not have foreseen. Uh, they they loved each other and they loved us and, and in very practical, everyday ways really helped me understand what that looks like and what it means. And deep into my own marriage with my own little daughter, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. As you describe that, and as I read different scenes in the book, it makes me want to wish that I was a, a fly on the wall at a at just at an average family dinner, <laughs> you know, and what that probably was 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 like. Another thing that I wondered in terms of the influence of your father is that you, when you were going through some of what he gave you, there's ways in which that could have manifest itself in, you know, you think about sort of intelligence, a love of language, and you know, a sense of justice that sometimes that can sort of create a uneasy blend of, of righteousness mm. or, you know, a little bit of, you know, a, you know, I don't want to say elite, but, but at the same time, everything I've read of yours or heard has such humility in it and uh, a curiosity to it. Even, you know, you, you, your previous book was on being wrong and an examination of, of that. And I was wondering if that's something that, you know, how that was manifested in your home or whether it's something that was developed later. It just, it seems such a unique gift to bring into the world in which so often when we're writing, it's as if we're advocating for something or trying to convince someone of something versus putting something out there to allow them to just think and consider and reflect. Mm. It's a really interesting question because certainly advocating for things and arguing over things actually were staple features of my childhood. You know, if you had sat in on, on one of those dinner table conversations, you know, we were, my dad and sister and me, not so much my mom, you know, we, we were kind of a rowdy bunch of Jews. We interrupted each other. We argued pretty passionately. <laughs> uh, what was what was all good family fun and, and recognized as such among the three of us might reasonably have seemed to an outsider like an actual argument, but it very seldom was. On the other hand, I do think there was a implicit and sometimes explicit understanding in the family that we were unbelievably fortunate to have the lives we were and that we should never mistake our good fortune for our own worthiness, uh, which isn't to say we weren't worthy. It's to say that everyone's worthy. And we were lucky and got a life full of resources and, and full of happiness and full of fortune of every possible kind. And, you know, I think because my father grew up under such difficult circumstances and exposed to so much trauma and dysfunction and poverty, uh, he was incredibly mindful of how omnipresent that is and, and how potent those forces are. And, you know, my dad actually did pretty much pull himself up by his bootstraps, but he would never in a million years have, have let me say so and still mm -hmm. less have suggested that that was, the, that was the solution and that was the way out. I think he was too mindful of all of the people who actually helped him, right? Mm -hmm. and, and too mindful of how very, very close he had been to failing at any moment, you know, to not being able to achieve that for any number of reasons, uh, economic, emotional, you know, you name it. So I do think he he had a sense of humility about that. He he was self-made, but but did not regard himself that way and, and understood how easily it could have been otherwise and how it was otherwise for many, 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 many people, um, many of whom were just as deserving, if not more so. I also think in some ways, you know, it's funny, but I grew up in the Midwest and I love the Midwest. I really do. And I, I, I think it's one can never honestly ascribe a whole set of values to a whole region. You know, regions are too var variable. People are too variable. But, you know, there is not an ethos of elitism. There is not an ethos of bragging. Mm. Uh, there's not an ethos of assuming, you know, that, that you have all the answers or, or that it's acceptable to act that way. And I'm listening to myself talk and thinking, well, that's ridiculous. You know, the Midwest is full of people who do all of those things. Um, 
some of them people of my acquaintance. <laughs> and frankly, I'm sure I've been that person from time to time. And yet I do think there is a there is like a little subtle streak in there that that matters or that that you can hang on to. And that, you know, it's not that it always and everywhere flourishes, but the the seed is there and, and it can be made to grow or helped to grow. I actually think my mom is um not at all an arrogant person, you know, quite the contrary. And mm. I don't think that she would have tolerated or, or been comfortable with the kind of tell everyone how to do things attitude. She was a school teacher and she loved her students and, and they loved her. Uh, and I think she just understood the limits of insisting on your own way in a certain sense. So, you know, I think all of those are probably forces. I also think the heart of journalism is or should be curiosity, you know, and Right. That's hard to maintain, and there are there are things we all want to advocate for, and there are absolutely things we should advocate for. But I'm grateful to to curiosity. I think it, uh, notwithstanding idioms about cats, I think it it serves us well in the world and serves us a lot better that, than in curiosity and insistence on our own rightness. There was something I read of yours, and I'm sort of half joking here, where it seemed like you did have a very strong point of view, and it sort of caught me off guard because generally I'm a, a fan of the writing, but you clearly had a bone to pick with Thoreau. <laughs> and, I, and I'm just wondering if there was like an impetus for for that. Everything you wrote was obviously factually accurate in terms of sort of the hypocrisy in terms of what he said and how he lived. But it was just an interesting sort of, uh, you know, take. And I was just curious sort of what was the impetus and maybe the, the response you got from that piece. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to draw a distinction between one's critical opinions and telling others how to live. Meaning some of what I True. do is, is work as a book critic, right? And, and my job right. in that capacity is to have informed and strong and persuasive responses to works of literature. And and if I don't, I'm not doing anyone any service. It doesn't matter if you disagree with me, but if I sit there and equivocate on the page, I'm not really any use to anyone. Right. Um, in the case of Thoreau, I mean, it bears saying that Mr. Henry David Thoreau uh, can more than withstand any any criticism <laughs> from some you know upstart at the New Yorker, and not least because he's extremely dead, <laughs> and his <laughs> reputation is extremely intact, as every high school student basically in the country knows. You know, this was not a, a case of bringing a gun to a knife fight. Uh, right. One should bring to a fight with Roe every tool one has in one's chest because he has generations upon generations of his own defenders and he's doing just fine. So in that sense, I didn't have any qualms. I would never, which is by way of saying, I would never attack like a debut novelist this way or, or this right, kind of right. thing. I, 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 I would only kind of sharpen my hatchet in an instance where I felt like there is a, a cultural phenomenon going on that, that bears our attention, mm. you know, and that for whatever reason is is an uncomfortable one for me or one that I feel needs, uh, needs some criticism. And I did feel that way about, about, I, I don't want to say Thoreau, about Walden in specific. There is much mm -hmm. to admire about Thoreau above and beyond his stance on abolition. Uh, and I, I try not to be dismissive of, of what's admirable uh, about him. He also does very beautiful nature writing uh, in, in places. And I like some of his other works better than I like Walden, but I'm a lot of what I'm writing against is not simply the book itself, although there is much to object to in the book, and I try to be very clear about all of it <laughs> in, in that piece. Um, but it's about the the reception of it, which at this point I think is very lazy. You know, I think many defenders of Thoreau, mm. frankly, haven't actually read much of him, uh, including Walden, or, or haven't read it in their grown adulthood. Right. You know, and and they have a sense of a symbol. You know, of a of a rugged individual defending a beautiful way of life and, and living in solitude by a pond in order to get back to the kind of bare marrow of things and th this kind of stuff, all of which might or might not be abstract goods. The question is like, first of all, do we admire those uh, those goals and aims? And second of all, did, did Thoreau really embody them? And I think right. that one can one can reasonably challenge both of those things. And, and that's what I set out to do in that piece. And to be honest, it was a ton of fun. And you can imagine the reaction, right? I mean, yeah. the passionate Thoreau lovers were extraordinarily irate. I think Walden is, is you know, one of the very few places on this planet where I may or may not be terribly welcome. On the other <laughs> hand, you know, throngs of people came out of the woodwork to say, oh, thank God, someone finally saying this. And I shouldn't say that. Plenty of people have said it before me. I'm hardly the first right. Thoreau critic. But interestingly, a great many English teachers actually wrote to me to say, I can't tell you how much I've hated having to teach that book year over year over year for decades. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, so I, I'm with you. I, I think you also... Uh, noted the beginning of that book is a is a is a bit of a slog you know you have to really sort of fight through that but what was also interesting again it's sort of like another sort of note of serendipity in that article you had commented on something you did appreciate um which was his description of the the ant fight 
mm. which uh, interestingly enough, I had just excerpted for another thing I was writing. So it was uh, <laughs> another thing where it's like this getting a little bizarre. So I, I want to move and talk a little bit about the role your partner has played not only in this book, but in your life. And uh, before doing so, I just noted, you know, throughout the book, you refer to her as C. And I don't know if that's because you wanted to not name her or what that's just how, what you call her. But it was a, a bit of a, a, a mystery to me as I was reading it. And, that, and the, it sounded familiar with some of the things you're describing. Like at one point you described, I think, going on a trip together to an Alabama courthouse. And I was like, is she talking about the person who wrote The Furious Hours, which I just absolutely <laughs> loved? And then I saw the the note in terms of the uh, credit for the your portrait. And so, um, so one, you can pass on that I, I loved her book, but I just was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about her role and who you are today. Yeah, I would be happy to. And first of all, I should say, uh, I, I can speak more to why I um, just used that initial C in the book, but uh, the short version is it absolutely wasn't uh, to throw a shroud of mystery over anything. Uh, my partner is Casey Sepp, as you say, author of Furious Hours, uh, and, and now a fellow staff writer at The New Yorker. Uh, and Yes, she's a perfectly public person in her own right and a brilliant writer. And in no way was I trying to obscure her identity. It was a writerly decision made for different reasons than that. And yeah, I mean, uh, what, what can I say? I, I guess the chief thing I would say is it brings me as much pleasure to talk about my partner as my father. Um, she is equally brilliant and remarkable unto me, uh, incidentally, equally self-made uh, in a way that I'm absolutely not. That's that's quite fascinating to me. And, you know, it's interesting. She's both very much in the book, definitely one of its two main characters, far more so than me, as a matter of fact, in all kinds of ways. But also, of course, the the, the chief character behind the book in that she was with me from from the moment the idea was born she helped bring it into being and with me every step of the way in writing it and so it's 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 quite sweet to me i feel like this book is both in ways visible to readers and in ways invisible to readers a, a tribute to to our partnership and and to the wonderful human being i married i'm curious was there a reaction when you sort of conceived of the book and said that there's this for lack of a term this yin and yang of two you know fundamental human sort of experiences and that she and your experience with her was going to carry the weight of, of one of those. Well, you know, it's very interesting. There was, of course, a reaction, which was she thought it was a beautiful idea and, and, and one I should write. And what's interesting to me, um, especially in retrospect, I didn't really think so much about it at the time. But, you know, Casey is a more private person than I am. And and at the time that we married, uh, or, or let alone the time we met, you know, there, there was absolutely no indication I was ever going to go off and write a memoir. You know, I'd done plenty of writing. And, <laughs> you know, th there was some first person. And it. it's not that I, I'm allergic to the use of, of, of I as a pronoun um, or, or to borrowing insights from my own life. But I certainly had never written anything particularly intimate about my own life, let alone at length. So... It's not like she, you know, married me in the full knowledge that I was inevitably going to write about our love story or our life in any way. Quite the contrary. <laughs> uh, and, and yet, you know, it is infinitely to her credit that not only did she take it in stride, she she did for this book which, what she does for all of my writing, which is make it better on its own terms, you know. And mm. uh, I do think it's it was and remains quite strange for her in some ways that our love story is, is out there in the world uh, between the pages of a book. But she more than under anyone understands why I wanted to write it and, and what purposes that love story is serving in the book. And I think uh, recognized even earlier than I did uh, how, how well this book could work as this kind of three-part meditation on, on these momentous experiences in our lives. And so I, yeah, I mean, kind of incredibly, if she, if she ever had a inner hesitation about it, she certainly never shared it with me which I think she would have. So safe to say she's she's been in the corner of the book from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, it is a beautiful articulation of a relationship and the adoration sort of like drips off the page in, a, in the best way possible. There's a, a point in there though that you do discuss some some of your interaction and relationship in meeting her family, which you know sounds in the description somewhat sort of different from what yours was or maybe different politically. And it's beautiful in that it's sort of breaks down what is most important in our lives, which is the love we have for each other and the love that we share when we both love the same people, right? And it's, you know, it's judgment-free um, and it's just really wonderful. And I was wondering if, like I was almost trying to figure out like how do you sort of replicate that on a societal level where we don't sort of see <laughs> the humanity as often as we should and people, you hear these stories 
um, especially during the pandemic where there were these very difficult confrontations or or um, differences of opinion in terms of how family members were treating this, especially if you're someone who lived in one place and moved to another. And I'm wondering if you just sort of can reflect a little bit about maybe the experience in, 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 in meeting them and talking to them and if you had any revelations in that, sort of post that and maybe even their response to the book. Sure. I mean, first of all, I should say that um, Casey's immediate family, uh, there, there's actually not a lot of daylight between uh, their politics and the politics that I grew up with, uh, except insofar as, uh, in some respects, I think they're possibly to the left of me in that she grew up in a mm. very strong union family, a, a working class family mm-hmm. that was incredibly mindful that uh, organized labor had had made their lives possible, you know, made it possible yeah. for them to raise three children and put all of them uh, through college in a way that her parents uh, did not have the opportunity to do. And in general, uh, you know, made, enabled them to have health care and braces and this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So with her immediate family, I mean, there's certainly uh, enormous differences, chiefly of, of educational background, class background, religious background, also geographic background. She's from a very, very rural area. I'm obviously from the kind of ritzy suburbs. So all of those differences were, were salient, but they weren't the kind of differences you're getting at, which is these very fraught political differences that uh, have always been troubling in our country and excruciatingly so in in the last you know half dozen years or so or more to be honest but but certainly um, excruciating in novel ways let's put it that way <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is absolutely the case that some of her extended family and certainly uh, some of the people I have met by virtue of of moving to the place where she grew up and becoming connected to to her community and to the people of of this region where we live has, you know, really made me wonder exactly what you're wondering, which is how do you replicate on a broader level uh, what what I feel happening uh, both to me and in me here? You know, it's very interesting. I am uh, one half of a lesbian couple. We now have a, a beautiful little daughter. And I know that my partner who grew up here had quite a lot of trepidation about bringing me home to this region, about living here, about having a baby here. And the fact of the matter is it's been a delight. Everyone adores our baby. And I, of course, you know, very highly objectively <laughs> think she just is adorable. But but, but no, I mean, it's, it's the case that we have been accepted here in ways unbelievably beautiful to me and beautiful to her. And it isn't just that we're a lesbian couple, right? They know exactly what our politics are. We are very open about them. We advocate passionately for them when it's necessary and appropriate to do so. And we do so across huge political differences. I have seldom been as touched by any response to my book as the incredibly beautiful letter I got from a a family friend and diehard Trump voter who truly wrote me just a letter you want to frame, a letter you want to save for your grandchildren about this book, about the fact that we chose to live here, about our relationship, about our daughter. So it's complicated, right? And and incredibly difficult sometimes. And the pandemic definitely made it difficult, you know, because we were very, very cautious about coronavirus, partly because we're community minded and partly because we were, in fact, you know, going through a pregnancy and having a baby in the middle of a global <laughs> pandemic. Um, and of course, it was very obvious, you know, who took it seriously and uh, who didn't. And, you know, in, in much the same way, it's very obvious who who believes there was a free and fair election in 2020 and who does not. And these are differences so enormous, they, they really do feel almost insurmountable. And it's fascinating to me that actually in day-to-day life, they aren't always. And I'm interested in, in how healthy that is. You know, I think that a, in a healthy society, actually political differences um, do not mean you have to despise other people and do not mean Mm. you can't live where you live and do not mean you need to boycott every third, you know, restaurant or other kind of hardware store, every establishment in your town, you know, that there, that there are, that there is a more peaceable way. And, and that peace can only come about if actually the differences do narrow. So you don't feel like what's, what's on the line is, existential, you know, your own existence, your own right to exist, or your country's existence and its right to exist. And for very good reasons, I think many of us have felt it is existential for the last many years now. And so it's tough. You know, I don't know the answer. I know that um, it's interesting to live somewhere where it's quite clear to me why my vote matters a lot more than it did in, in the years that I lived in the New York area. It's interesting to me to live in a place where I feel like my presence matters more and the conversations I have matter more and and the people I encourage to run for the school board or the county council matters more. And 
it's certainly not without its challenges, but I'm so grateful for them. You know, I've learned an enormous amount. Some of it really sobering, you know. I mean, the criticisms of the left about their fundamental ignorance, not not by any means across the board of, of, of voting Democrats, but of some segments of, of the left who are writing the articles or setting the tone or creating the political campaigns. It's, it's, not, it's not always wrong to say that they're profoundly out of touch with the animating realities of, of life in rural America or life uh, in, in parts of conservative America or in the working class. And I, I see that very vividly. And I'm grateful for, for what I've learned from living here and from other people who live here. And I wish I had um, better and, and more sweeping and more effective answers than that. But I do feel, you know, my own life has been changed so dramatically by the stunningly rapid advancement of, of gay rights in this country. And I do think a lot of that advancement came about because actually, you know, you can move to a segregated suburb and you can pull your kids out of the public schools and, and put them in private schools and you can travel in, in your bubble, whether your bubble is, is all the way on the right or all the way on the left. But you actually can't avoid having a gay kid. It just happens, right? And the queer right. neighbors and, and the pastor's kid is queer, whatever. You know, it, it, I, I, and I do think that in a very fundamental way, rights for lesbian and gay and bisexual and, and, you know, to some extent trans people, although that's moving slowly and we're watching it unfold with, with great pain and difficulty, as did, as did other kinds of gay rights. Um, it, those happened because actually we all were living in the same community, you know, and, and to the extent that other change can happen, I, I think it probably does happen, as it were, from the inside in that sense, you know, from from less friction between communities and more friction within communities. And right now I'm the friction in my community and I'm not sure that's a terrible thing. It's uncomfortable occasionally, but not terrible. You know, it brings up an, uh, an interesting point, which is, you know, recently, you know, this question of distance, right, and where you are and how you're situated and where you have impact. And recently I went back, I, um, I grew up outside of Boston, but I spent most of my sort of high school and junior high school years in rural Pennsylvania, probably not too far from where you are. It's in, in York County, mm, uh, sure. just uh, north of, uh, yeah. And so I recently went back to give some remarks at the high school that I graduated from. And just the sense of community that you get when you're there and people having each other's backs and how, you know, the conversations I'd have with different folks, not once did I ever know or wonder what their political affiliation was, but I was able to immediately sense that this is a decent human being. Right. Mm -hmm. And even the frustrations I may have with members of my own family over their beliefs, they're so easily bridged, you know, um, in terms of, you know, not solving it, but not letting it lead to any kind of festering animosity or difference or questioning of love or, or whatnot which goes to show how important it is to be proximate and connected to people and the role of community. And, uh, you know, I, I know that, you know, much, much was my case and maybe in, in the case of others, this idea of people leaving their community and then going and getting educated and not coming back or having a difficult relationship with it. And I wonder how much that has contributed to where we are instead of, you know, people staying or returning or moving in your case. And just how that creates and adds to the richness of a fabric that maybe is the only real sort of lever to to understanding. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that it does, you know. And it's very interesting to me. One of the one of the many differences between Casey and me is I never wanted to move home. You know, it never crossed my mind from age 12 on that I that I would live where I grew up. <laughs> Casey always wanted to come home. You know, she she loves where she's from and uh, loves it in the very complicated uh, way that she does, but but loves it nonetheless. And it is very interesting, you know, that decision, and uh, it, especially because it's so easy to imagine the version of her that in no universe would want to make that decision. You know, she's queer. She is you know, went to Harvard and went to Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship and studied theology and is one of the most genuinely brilliant and intellectual people I know. And she chose to return to a community where, you know, we once jokingly realized we looked at the uh, like census data on the town where she's from and there's five people there with advanced degrees and we could name all of them and four of them were related to her. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it, you know, it's, it's not an obvious right. choice in some ways. And it's, it's interesting to me that she's always wanted to. And I should say, you know, in defense of those who move away, I really get it, right? Like, I mean, aside from the fact that I was one, although I moved away yeah. from a perfectly liberal enclave, we were talking about existential threats earlier. You know, for some people it is actually 
what's on the line if you choose to stay where you're from truly is your existence, whether literally you're actually in mortal danger, which which tragically some people are, or or, or simply um, psychologically, you know, there is not room where you are from to be who you are. And the toll of fighting those fights every single day is, is not worth it. And people very reasonably feel, why should I be the one to bear this toll? You know, I have one life to live. I'm not going to live it here. I'm not going to spend my life trying to educate the benighted or what have you. Right, right, right. To me, I mean, all those understand it's sort of a credit to Casey, I guess, in that like what you do see sometimes is that when someone leaves, that they can have a very judgmental view of where they came from. You see this often a lot in politics, right? You know, you see it often in memoirs where, you know, someone has quote unquote made it or done well. And the way to make sense of that is to criticize those who are not doing well or look at the issues that have, have contributed to that. Versus if you're if you're connected to community and you have loved ones there, then the natural reaction you would hope would be to to, to love them for who they are and experience and appreciate that all of our experiences are are different and are and unique. Sure. I mean Casey once very concisely uh, when I was kind of asking her about her I think I would say patriotism, you know, love of country, but also love of, of, of you know, quite locally where she's from. I, she said very concisely and very much in the language of where she's from, she said, well, you know, you got to dance with them, what brung you? And, and if that means you spend six years living at home fighting to, you know, get a Confederate statue torn down, that's that's what that means. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We didn't speak much about the third word in your title, uh, and although it's probably in some ways so critical because it sort of speaks to... Um, how we are connected, it bridges what sometimes are disparate concepts. And it also just sort of speaks, I mean, you, you, you write of Whitman's observations in terms of just the way in which we're all connected, um, you know, as one sort of ongoing sort of stream or river. And I wonder if you could just sort of reflect quickly. I mean, we, you know, again, I don't want to be make overarching sort of generalizations about our society, but I don't think we do nuance very well. And we like to sort of see things as polar opposites and not two things that seem diverse as being intricately connected. And I wonder if that's something that was part of the premise from the get-go or something that as you were writing, there was a deeper appreciation for that. And again, if there's anything you learned from connecting the idea of, of, of losing and finding to the way in which you now see connections of other kinds of ideas that maybe people would see as not connected at all. Well, it was definitely part of the premise from the get-go. In fact, it is literally the reason I wrote the book. I had, mm. uh, as I said, I'd, I'd written about my father uh, after his death in a way that was kind of partly a eulogy, but partly an exploration of this very strange category of loss and this this kind of question of like, why would I put my dead father in the same category as like, you know, my wallet and my cell phone and the sock that vanished in the washing mm. machine. Uh, and I realized, you know, that there was this kind of um, mirror image story that could be told, which was a story about discovery and all the many fascinating things that we find, you know, from that missing sock to, you know, dinosaur bones or a, a vaccine for a global pandemic to the love of our life. And I, I realized I could explore that category and in the same way have the emotional heart of that be my love story, you know, the story of the greatest thing I myself mm -hmm. ever found. Uh, but it really was not until this idea of and came to mind, you know, that, that this lost and found. That was the moment that I wanted to write the book because what I realized right away is that, of course, our losses and our discoveries are profoundly connected, you know, not just in my case because I happened to, uh, you know, find my partner and, and lose my father in quite quick succession, but but because we only grieve what we love, right? So so inevitably our joy and our sour, sorrow are profoundly bound together. And more to the point, so are all kinds of things, right? Like that's that's the reality of adult life, adult experience. You know, you experience many things at once and you feel many things about at once. You feel many things about the same thing, let alone many things about all the many things happening to you. You know, you 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 love your brother, but he drives you completely insane and and you, you know, adore your children but can barely stand to be in the same room as your ex-husband you know w without whom you would never have those mm. children in the first place like th this is this is what we live with right is this kind of endless contradiction and, and combination of experience and 
I was very interested in the way all of these things are connected. And to your point, interested in them in part because, because connection is so interesting and so beautiful. And we do live in a world and in a moment that tends to emphasize disconnection, right? And, and all the ways that we are not bound together and bound to one another. But of course we are. Uh, our experiences are bound together in many and complicated ways and, and we as humans are bound together in many and complicated ways. And to me that was a very beautiful idea and, and it was it was honestly that that made me want to write the book. You make me think there was, sometimes you read something, there's a fact and that fact will forever be sort of uh, engraved in your mind. And the revelation that the symbol for and, I think, if, if I'm getting this correctly, was an originally part of our alphabet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was it was essentially kicked to the curb by a nursery rhyme to remember our letters. And it just goes to show how elemental sort of that idea was. And I conversely, I wonder if it's almost too bad the word but was invented, because in most cases, and would have sufficed, right? That these may be conflicting ideas, you know, your example about your brother, you love him and he annoys you versus, but he annoys you, right? Something that can instantly cause some division. But I was just, I was just sort of blown away by that idea. And also now moving forward, trying to catch myself from trying to sort of make a distinction that adds to a conflict or a difference like, but, or whatever, and instead just hold two thoughts that may seem opposed in concert by the use of a simple word. Mm. That's such a beautiful point about but. I mean, look, I'm a writer. I, I welcome all words and they're extraordinarily useful. But but I think you're right to note that we very often use but uh, when we can and probably should just use and and when it would be sort of emotionally clarifying, right? Because although the two experiences might be very different, they aren't actually uh, separate or separable. And we do feel them both and are experiencing them both. And so and does it a little bit better justice. You've um, been so generous with your time, and I want to be respectful of, of ending close to when we agreed to. But I want to end with hopefully one last question. The name of the show is Attribution. And so uh, it is really trying to take a moment and figure out what we attribute, where we end up to in life, and the kinds of ideas, like what we lose and what we find, contribute to the way we see our own journeys. But each show I end by sort of seeding the idea of credits over mm -hmm. to the guest. And so, uh, not to put you on the spot, but if there's anyone that you wanted to name that we haven't discussed already that you wanted to just give a quick shout out, obviously viewers may not know their name, but I just uh, really love the idea of people's names being said out loud who have made a difference to who we are, or how we ended up where we are. So I'll uh, give you a, a little time if you wanted to uh, end with some credits for uh, Catherine Schultz. Gosh, what a beautiful request. I love the image of these names just rolling as I say them. Obviously, the first would be Isaac Schultz, my father, and Casey Sepp, my partner. But yes, uh, far beyond those two people we haven't talked about today, uh, Margot Schultz, my mother, Laura Schultz, my sister, her entire incredible family. That's Sue Kaufman, uh, MJ Kaufman, Henry Falowski, Rachel Novick, and absolutely my in-laws, Bill and Sandy Sepp, and Caitlin and Melinda Sepp, all of whom have not, not just made this book come into being, but profoundly shaped my life in some cases from my birth, uh, in, in other cases more recently. Oh my gosh, I left out my youngest and very adored little niece, Adele Kaufman Schultz, who, you know, very much deserves to be on the list. And this is the problem with putting someone on the spot for all the credits. You didn't have time to write them, but that's the very, that's the very short list. Those are the nearest and dearest and the that's people about whom I wouldn't be who I am today. Uh, we do give the caveat that you are on the spot and uh, anything is uh, <laughs> anything left out is an act of omission, not commission. So thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you again. For, yeah. <laughs> thank you. This has been really wonderful and uh, wish you continue to look forward to whatever you write next. And uh, thanks for, for joining. Thanks so much for having me on. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone in particular, make their day and let them know. <laughs>